Good evening. I'm here tonight to talk to you about Lord John, who's my favorite introvert other than my wife. <laughs> so Lord John was, well, he became the fifth Duke of Portland when his father, the fourth Duke, died in 1854. And he became one of the richest men in the world, but he wasn't really supposed to be the fifth Duke of Portland. His elder brother died, and that's what led this painfully introverted man to rise to be the fifth Duke. And his father really didn't want him to be the heir. His father, ever loving and warm, uh, wrote to him, didn't say this to him in person, wrote to him as was his habit and said, hey, your mom's crazy. We think it's sort of following in the family line and you've got it. You probably shouldn't have kids. <laughs> and the family motto was fear disgrace. <laughs> what make, which makes it really difficult to live a full individual life in a time where duty and expectations were everything. So Lord John inherits a huge amount of money, Welbeck Abbey, thousands of acres of land, and just funds galore. And he also inherited the expectations of his position and his class. And he was supposed to enter politics and society. And the first thing he did was he gave up his post in Parliament to his youngest brother, George. And he never wound up throwing a ball. Instead, he built a life that suited his desire for space and for privacy at Welbeck Abbey, and he never looked back. So his father had believed that there would be a great shortage of oak trees. So he'd put these beautiful big oaks all over Welbeck Abbey. So, Task one, he cut down all the oak trees. <laughs> now, soon thereafter, he takes down all of the paintings in the house, the portraits, the pastorals, the still lives. He has a bonfire. He got to burn daddy down. But he takes all of that wood from the oak groves, and he builds a network of rooms and tunnels underground <laughs> Welbeck Abbey. He built 15 miles of tunnels. This is in like the late 1800s. He employed like 15,000 workmen on site. Nope, 1,500. And he, a thousand yard tunnel connected the house to the riding house. He had a 1.25 mile tunnel that fit two carriages side by side. He also built a ballroom and a hydraulic lift, but again, never threw a ball. <laughs> oh, also everything below ground was painted pink, which is amazing. So he also really loved chicken and he demanded that at all times a chicken be cooking in the house and he'd eat two meals a day, half a chicken. And a problem in these big houses back in the day was that you'd have to ship your chicken from the kitchen to your room and it would be cold by the time it got up there. Also, you'd have to interact with somebody. So he created the chicken railroad. <laughs> Little trucks that would ship him his meal. So again, it would be hot and he wouldn't have to say hello or look somebody in the eyes. So he ignored the fashion of his time, instead living the life he wanted and dressing the way that he felt was most efficient and comfortable. Uh, maybe not the hat, it was a huge top hat, way bigger than for, for the time. He wore multiple layers of coats, frilly shirts. Uh, he also had his tailors, you can see in the picture behind me, he, he put these ties in by the knees that he saw his workmen dressing with this so he could tie them up for the muck that he, has to, he used to have to go through to do building on the estate. Uh, he also had three layers of socks, the bottom layer silk, which sounds rather comfortable and warm. But he was also obsessed with modern technology, hence all the building. So he really thought umbrellas were awesome. So he gave them out to everybody. 
he also always, always had one. So when he went walking, which was always at night, he'd carry one around, he'd open it up, and he'd wear his coats around his face and his hat, and he'd have a servant walk 40 yards ahead of him with a light. He was really into that privacy. And here's the moment where if my wife was here, she'd open up her umbrella, but she can't be here tonight. <laughs> so he employed thousands of workers on site. He was known as an eccentric. You were not really supposed to approach him or look in the eye unless he approached you first, but he paid them well. He employed them, and he earned the nickname the worker's friend. And much like his father, he communicated mostly by mail. Uh, he had a system of letter boxes would, uh, to communicate. He would only let his uh, personal valet into his room, not even doctors. But then, after all of this, after all this building, he died at the ripe old age of 79, having realized that despite expectations, he had what is today referred to as fuck you money. <laughs> Enough to build a life around his introversion and his eccentricities and throw a middle finger to societal expectations. But then, a lady named Anna Maria Drews came forward and said that the whole eccentric shut-in thing was a ruse. And that he'd use those miles of tunnels to go out into the nearby city and live the life of a commoner, a middle-class merchant named T.C. Drews. He opened the Baker Street Bazaar, was reasonably successful as a merchant, had a wife, had children, and then when he decided he was done living the life of a commoner, he decided to just fold up that personality, get rid of that shell, fake his death, bury a leaded coffin, and go back to being the fifth Duke of Portland. I know, right? That's how I'm going out. Of course, this meant that she, her father-in-law, of course, was T.C. Drews, which would make her son the sixth Duke of, Duke of Portland. So Miss Drews actually got a significant amount of factual information. People say, saying, yeah, yeah, those are the same two guys. And if you look at the photos, it's not too far off. And yet, <laughs> turns out it costs a lot to go to court. And the court said, hey, you, you have to come up with 10,000 pounds in the late 1800s to make this happen. But she was not a woman to be stopped. So she started a corporation to fund her lawsuit and selling shares in her son's future estate valued at approximately 16 million pounds at the time as collateral to fund her lawsuit, a, a la Peter Thiel and Hulk Hogan. <laughs> so the Druce case, she had pamphlets distributed, and really these worked to spread the good facts, not the bad facts, because that's not how you get investors, <laughs> about her story, and it worked. It was crowdfunding for litigation. But her efforts were further thwarted when it was revealed that T.C. Druce had been married before at the age of 16 and had had children, which meant he had heirs, which mean, meant there was another potential sixth Duke of Portland. So, of course, uh, Anna Maria was pissed. Um, <laughs> the new potential sixth Duke of Portland was George Hollenby. And he started three companies, much like Miss Drews, to fund litigation, each round raising more funds, and you could buy a share for as much as a pound and as little as a shilling. That wasn't my laugh line, but I appreciate it. I'll take it. <laughs> so two main witnesses at trial. Robert Caldwell testified that he knew the Duke and T.C. Drews. He helped build the, buy the coffin and helped buy 200 pounds of lead and helped fake the funeral. However, on cross-examination, it was revealed that he'd been involved in a similar scandal in America involving disputed wills and a disappearing body, which is an interesting parallel. It was also revealed that in the States, he was known as the great American affidavit maker <laughs> due to all of the false affidavits that he had filed. 
So the second witness was Mary Robinson. And frankly, she did better than him. Um, she claimed that she had a journal that she'd written contemporaneously while working for both the Duke and for T.C. Druce, uh, and that they were essentially the same man. This journal, by the way, had been used prior to litigation to kind of flash to investors to get them to invest more. She was sort of obliterated on cross, both tainted by Mr. Caldwell's testimony and also the fact that she really couldn't keep her facts straight. So, eventually, the trials led, uh, in both the press and in the courts, pressed family members of T.C. Drews to just consent to digging him up, to exhuming, uh, to exhuming either the empty coffin or the body. A friend that had worked with him at the Baker Street Bazaar, uh, whose name was Thakra, which is definitely going to be my first child's name, <laughs> confirmed that one, there was a body in the coffin, and two, it was in fact T.C. Drews without a doubt, which ended the affair. What happened to our witnesses? They were royally screwed. Uh, Anna Maria Drews, who didn't actually make it to the trial, she lost kind of her uh, ticket when a new heir got in line. She wound up in an, ins an insane asylum and wasn't even really around for the exhumation. Robert Caldwell, uh, he was, <laughs> a warrant for his arrest went out the minute they found a body for perjury, um, but he also died in an asylum, which frankly, the number of people that die in, a, in an asylum due to this case makes you think there might actually be some legs to it. But, eh. And then Mary Rob Robinson did four years for perjury. But here's the thing. At the end of the day, the fifth Duke of Portland and T.C. Druce turned out to just be eccentric men who didn't live to the ex expectations of the Victorian age, but instead really lived their lives suited to their eccentric personalities. So, a toast to Sir John for, to, and to building the lives that we choose no matter the cost. Harvey has a, woo! <laughs> Wait, wait, wait. This was my cunning plan to make one last appearance. Not very cunning. I did buy the heaviest microphone out there. I did, I did. Thank you, Colin. Uh, thank you to all of tonight's speakers and to all of you who came out tonight. Um, it's gonna stay, it's gonna stay, I'm not gonna touch it. Um, before we leave tonight, um, I want to thank all of you once again for coming out where, it, there it is. God, so many details. Um, Thank you all. We will be back. We had, uh, we had to have a lot of conversations amongst ourselves about what it meant to make, to make it to five years and what we want to see in the new year. I think a lot of you know that we have successfully test launched a chapter in New York. And so coming in the new year, some, some new projects, some new endeavors from all of us. I hope you will all be here to be part of those because this is no fun without all of you being part of it. And all of you become all of us very quickly. So if you have story ideas that you would like to, to throw into the basket, even though we don't have a salon on the calendar yet, I still invite you to throw your stories into our speakers form because all of the curators, we turn to that every time we begin the curation process for new salons. If you have friends in New York, you should rally them to come out when we begin the series in New York. Um, and I hope to see you all back here in the new year. 
I'd like to raise my last class of this year to um, a quote from Charles Darwin that we began this evening with, and he wrote, I love fool's experiments. I am always making them. And I would like to raise our glass to our shared fool's experiment and to all of us. And since I don't have an next salon to announce just yet, I'd like to invite you to join our email list. We are working for those of you who are members. We are already working on our membership activities for the next year. We have some photography outings planned. Uh, we have a tentative, uh, Kate has made an offer to do another backstage at the Exploratorium, which we did before, which is really fun. Um, and some other things, if you'd like to suggest an exploration that you would like to see us do, you can always drop me a line. Um, we are always happy to entertain those. Uh, here is the link where if you'd like to submit a talk, if you're interested in becoming a member, um, we have a new membership form up online. It's good for 2019 and we'll be sending out the new cards shortly. And we do have a little gift suitable for giving if you would like to give a gift membership. There is now an option to select this is a gift and we will send um, a little tiny cabinet of curiosities to the new member of your choice. So you can find that on the website there. Um, you can find us in all the usual places. We'll be sharing more of our videos that John has created as we go into the hiatus of some of our favorite stories along with the, the reading materials and the supplementary stuff from tonight's talks. You can join the conversation in something weird. We hope to see you there. And I'd really, really like to once again thank Public Works for making us home here. And I'd like to thank all of tonight's speakers. This was great. Thank you, guys. And to the army of volunteers that came out and helped, I hope everyone got to, got to enjoy. How was the art gallery, right? Thank you to tonight's artists. Thank you to the fellows. Thank you to the members. Thank you to all of you who donated during our first Giving Tuesday campaign. It is great to know that we can go into this uh, hiatus knowing that we uh, are not totally at loose ends. Um, and I look forward to seeing you again in the new year. Thank you for being here. Cheers.